halfling sorcerers and dragonborn wizards. That's what I wanted to say in the beginning. <laughs> we'll say it now and just chop it and put it in the front. <laughs> dragonborn wizards and halfling dragonborn. Crap. Try again. <laughs> <laughs> Hello there, adventurers, and welcome to Wally DM. Today I'm joined by Fred from the How to D&D YouTube channel and we're going to take a look at the very first subject that comes up in Tasha's Cauldron of Everything and that is customizing your origin. If you're not familiar with that, this is an optional rule and I say that because it's got to stick in your head that this is optional. If this is not going to work for you, don't put it in your game. Tasha's is filled with optional material, but I find this is uh, very much worth talking about. So uh, thanks for joining me today, Fred. You are most welcome. I uh, will enjoy this conversation. I was actually thinking of talking about it in my own uh, video, but uh, I don't need to now. Okay, so in today's video, we're going to take a look at the subjects. Now, there are four parts about customizing your origin, and the very first one uh, has to deal with ability scores, so we're going to concentrate on that, but it also includes languages, proficiencies, and personalities. So let's start with the first one, Fred, and that is the ability score increases. So so what this is basically saying is if you want to play half orc as it currently stood, you had a plus two to strength and a plus one to constitution. But if you wanted your half orc to be a wizard, you would want some intelligence on there. And what Tasha's customizing your origin is going to do is it says, hey, if you want to put that plus two in intelligence and that plus one in wisdom, then you're more than welcome to do so. So let's start off with our first question. What do you think of this, Fred? Is this uh, what are some of the positives that are going to come out about as far as your players being being able to change their ability scores to fit whatever class they're going to play. Well, actually, first off, I think that being able to shift the ability modifiers as a optional rule is probably only optional if it's your own home game. And if you're playing Dungeons and Dragons Adventurers League, it's not going to be optional. I think that's something that they will probably hard bake into um, organized play for Dungeons and Dragons 5e. I think that's definitely going to happen. I've already run into the problem. My players are saying, Fred, are you going to allow the stuff in Tarshis uh, before Tarshis is in their hand? And I can already see what's rattling through their brain. Um, the power gamers and the min maxes are having wet dreams right now. Um, so it's ultimate flexibility. Well, let's get real. That's what they've tried to do. They've tried to give you ultimate flexibility um, it's definitely really helpful if you're a min max or a power gamer because you can pretty much adjust things however you want and when i was doing character builds i always found that that's essentially what i was looking for is like oh hang on i'm stuck mm -hmm. i can't move this anywhere it's this one so where's there is there is there a race that's actually going to work with this um you don't really need to worry about going and checking out all of those online instructions and guides with regard to what's the best race to play mm -hmm. for a class now because none of them will help you in the slightest right. <laughs> <laughs> you can make what you want and i think that's really what the selling point is in terms of marketing and the player base being able to just give them whatever they want that's going to capture a larger selection of the population um, who play the game and I think that's why that's been done. Yeah. Um, and, and I do believe you're right. I do believe that Adventures League is going to have this where you could, this will be a, a rule that you can use. Uh, so it, I think you're right. It won't be optional. It'll be something if you want to swap ability scores around, you can do so with Adventures League. Um, and, and some of the things that, that I thought of that as far as positives go are you're, you're probably going to see some races that, weren't as common before because maybe so and so likes to play a bard and there's all I, I mean you think about it the way that things were or without the optional rule there's only a, maybe a third of the races that are going to complement a bard as far as giving you that charisma bonus that dexterity bonus or things like that but now taking the half orc for example if you want a half orc that can sing and play guitar you're going to be able to do so and get the benefit of those ability score modifiers and I think another positive that's going to come out of this as well is in creating backstories. Why is that half work? Why is he charismatic? Why, why is she uh, dexterous and stuff as opposed to half works usually being strong and healthy and things like that? 
there being a few positives coming out of it, what are some of the drawbacks that are going to evolve from being able to swap some of these scores around? I think probably it's going to start creating a bit of conflict between dungeon masters and players, particularly players who want this and dungeon masters who don't want to use this or don't want to use all of this. I think that's definitely something that's likely to occur specifically in home groups. It won't be an issue in Dungeons and Dragons Adventurers League because there are you just follow whatever you're given. Mm -hmm. um, unless, of course, we have a bunch of dungeon masters who are running public games who suddenly decide they've had enough and they decide to just quit. Um, that, <laughs> I suppose, is a, a possibility. I think also what it does to the races, and I was looking back at older versions of the game, but you will know more about this than I do because you've been playing older versions that I have and mm -hmm. you've been playing for longer. And that is that some of the races won't look quite as distinct by mucking around with ability scores. I think that's going to certainly happen. Um, some of the races that get used, you're going to see pretty much the same race being utilized for many of the different classes because there are certain races that have bigger numbers and so, uh, you know assigned to them. So mm -hmm. therefore, we can see a lot more of them. Um, there will be some races with ability scores that will sort of never get played um, because mechanically somebody decides, well, you know, the only thing to do is to just play the stuff that's mechanically useful um, and we'll ditch the other stuff. Um, not all players work that way, but I think based on the excitement around this book, that I think a vast portion of our population and community who play the game are going to be looking for the best mechanical um, advantage. Mm -hmm. And with with that in mind, I believe one of the races that a lot of folks are pointing to is the Mountain Dwarf, because they get a plus two and a plus two, which is one more than most other races get. I had to do the math real quick. But... <laughs> Uh, yeah, so, and, and and also with the Mountain Dwarf, they also get proficiency in light to medium armor, I believe, if, I, if I'm not mistaken, which makes them a great candidate for like a wizard or a spellcaster. They can simply take that plus two, plus two, and put it in their intelligence or in their charisma or whatever and um, get the benefits from that. I so that next question is... Are there any races that you believe will be played more now that they have the luxury of being able to pick their own ability scores? Oh, yeah. yeah. Besides Mountain the Mountain Dwarf. <laughs> I see in the future, with my little eye, all races are now Mountain Dwarf. Um, <laughs> I think that there's going to be a lot of Mountain Dwarves. Um, even the Triton, you know, because you get a plus one in three different locations. Um, ah, and you can shuffle that around. Uh, I think that's certainly going to be one that's going to get played a lot. The Aracocra, because now you can move around the plus two and the plus one, and you can fly. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I think the human will still get a lot of play because you get a plus one in every single ability, and it's usually numerically better than a lot of the other options there, mm -hmm. but you don't get a lot of cool stuff. You know, yeah. getting a feat is all very well or some extra skills or something like that. Um, but those are the ones that I can see being used a lot. Um, yes, I see a world where all characters are mountain dwarves. <laughs> that, that would be an interesting world. That's a lot of Scottish accents, if I do say so myself. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, the only way to tell the mountain dwarves apart are either Scottish accent, uh, American accent, or Russian accent. <laughs> 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 However you like to talk about, you know, with your dwarf. <laughs> So with that in mind, what about races being played less? Does this optional rule diminish any of those where people only played them because of a certain thing? And now that this optional rule is in there, they're not going to do it anymore? Yeah, I think there definitely is. Okay. So the races that I think that probably won't get a lot of play now numerically because of what's been provided is the variant human which is weird because the variant human was like the strongest race in mm -hmm. some respects, but you only get a plus two. You can assign anywhere you like. Mm -hmm. uh, it was the ultimate in flexibility. And now you've given everybody flexibility. So variant human just went down, uh, down to sort of 
almost the bottom of the list yeah. uh, for anybody. I actually am not sad. I'm glad to see it go personally myself. Um, there, there I used to be a lot of hate against the variant human as far as a lot of people picking it just for that feat and being able to put those ability scores where they want. Yeah, I, I think that it was certainly one aspect to it. Um, I think also we can absolutely see um, Kobold is not going to get much love because you only get a plus two mm. to Dex. That's it. Um, yeah, sure, you've got uh, Dark Vision, but I don't think that is not going to be one that people are going to pick up. And then there's also that custom lineage option mm. where you can put a, a plus two anywhere you like. You get a feat and a skill. Or if it's not a skill, it's a proficiency. If it's not a proficiency, you get dark vision. Um, and it's just not going to be as good as some of the other races. And it, what sort of race is that? That's the non-distinct who knows what the race is. Um, I don't like it. I think really what they should have done is if you're going to build races and do this sort of thing, the standard really is a plus two and a plus one. Yeah, I like that standard. Uh, and, and you're referring to the uh, custom lineage, which is the other rule where you do, you kind of like build a bear or build a, build a race. You kind of just, you pick the things that you want and apply it however you see fit. Um, so pretty much your race is just a name only. You could pick a dwarf, but it doesn't look anything like a dwarf because you homebrewed it using the options in there. That's, that's definitely not one of my favorite features either. Okay, so we've covered ability scores and a little bit of custom lineage. Let's look at the other three parts of customizing your origin, and that is languages, proficiency swaps, and personality options. Now, a lot of races are tied into the culture and things of that nature, and these three items here allow you to take your, let's say a dwarf, for example, take your dwarf and change it with a different backstory. Instead of being raised by dwarves, maybe your dwarf was raised by elves and they need to change their languages or some of their skills are different. It, perhaps you have an elf that was raised by those that aren't proficient with a longbow, but are musicians and stuff. So they need to swap out some abilities. Uh, Fred, as a dungeon master, how far do you let these options go do you allow would you allow your players to just min max right off of the bat or is this something that they would have to provide their ideas or provide uh, a really good backstory in order for you to let these go through i think that <clears throat> this aspect of it is the one i like the most okay. um this is the one area where shifting things around feels uh, a bit more sensible because there should be some variation within the culture um, not every single race that comes out is built to go adventuring. Um, and, and that's essentially what they feel like when you look in the player's handbook mm -hmm. and some of the other options, is everything seems to be built for a specific place within the combat, combat world of Dungeons and Dragons. Mm -hmm. You know, are they a wizard? Are they a fighter? Are they going to be the charismatic individual? Are they the explorer? You know, which race works that way? I don't like that very much. Never have. That cultural shift that you've got, because that's essentially what we're talking about. Mm -hmm. A lot of the things we're talking about are our language and proficiencies, which does cover a lot of the cultural stuff. Not completely. I think that exists in the real world. So I don't have an issue with bringing some of those aspects into Dungeons and Dragons. I don't want all of it because mm -hmm. there's a reason why we play Dungeons and Dragons to get away from that. Right. All right. I don't like the idea of the personality stuff being involved in the origins and lineages. I, th I feel like that should be, shouldn't even come into play. That if you build your character and it has a particular personality, does it really need to be based strictly on that particular race? Mm -hmm. I know there will be certain things that that culture might sort of exhibit more often, but I don't feel like that's something that needs to be so hard baked into the game. <sighs> there are other things that I don't like about it, and that is that the, the cultures of the races are going to get watered down by providing this in our fantasy or Dungeons and Dragons world, because there's going to be a lot more variation. Mm -hmm. So the watering down, I don't like. The thing that I am a little bit concerned about is players taking their ancestral language and swapping that out yeah, and then picking up something else, which 
I'm sure you could sit down and create some sort of background to explain it, but usually, you know, you could, I mean, you could paint a donkey or stick a tail on a donkey and call it anything you like, you know? I don't like that particular aspect of what they could do with the languages. I do like the idea that not every single race speaks common. Mm -hmm. So swapping out that almost every race is given common and their ancestral language. And if they're really lucky, they get a third one. Mm -hmm. um, but the idea of races that don't all speak common, I like that idea a lot. Yeah. Yeah. That, that would be very interesting for a player to come to the table that maybe just knows a very, a little bit of common or, you know what, actually it doesn't really even matter because everybody's going to be playing dwarves anyway. So it's, as long as they know dwarf, they're fine. <laughs> They'll find that rare human settlement and they're all speaking common. They're like, what are these people saying? Cause my dwarf speak, I, I speak dwarf and, and, and ancient dwarf. I don't know anything else. <laughs> <laughs> oh okay give me a second just i need a drink of water just to compose myself and i'll continue answering your question okay. all right so being able to shift around the language that's provides you with a lot more options and flexibility and i actually like that feature i always felt it was quite restrictive what they had given you i didn't understand why we necessarily particularly if you got three languages you had to be locked down to the third one um, some races didn't do that but I do like the idea of being able to adjust things. The only aspect is I don't like the idea of them trying to shift out the ancestral language because I feel like that's pushing the, the line too far. Um, changing proficiencies, that doesn't concern me at all. I really feel like a culture would have a lot of variation within it anyway. They've got different roles. Everybody within that society is going to specialize in a particular role or have a different focus. So they don't all have to be built for adventuring. Uh, in terms of backstories, I've never particularly liked long winded backstories myself. And I don't like it when players create backstories to support the mechanics uh, that they have just to support the mechanics that they have. Yeah. Um, and you never know why they've done that because you can't get inside their brain. So I'm not really too worried about lining up the backstory with the mechanics because if I really wanted them to do them do that, they could, like I said, they can make that happen. No, no problems. It's not yeah, difficult to do. You can figure out how to make, you know, a stone look like a beach ball if you really wanted to. Um, uh, what else is there? Oh, yes. All of the stuff should have been in another book, right? Is there another book that this should have been in? God, can I find it? Where is it? Where is it? Oh, that's down here this book here this one player's handbook That'd all nice. this stuff should have been in here yeah and it's not in here mm -mm. instead we've got it in a different book i'm like this is the book it should have been in would have been that hard it's not a big section no. <laughs> <laughs> i guess they're planning for their future and, and in two years we'll get more rules that could have been in the player's handbook and that's going to be in Bargle's big book of everything or <laughs> something like that. <laughs> I think the book's going to be titled The Never-Ending Book of Everything. <laughs> Here's everything that wasn't in everything. <laughs> <laughs> so one of the things that kind of caught my attention is the proficiency swaps. And I'm looking off to this chart right here. As we talked about, uh, you would have no problem uh, swapping things out. It actually, Tasha actually gives you a chart of things that if you wanted to swap out, you can, such as a skill for a skill. You can swap out armor for a simple or martial weapon or a tool, a simple weapon for a simple weapon or a tool, a martial weapon for a simple martial or a tool, or a tool for a tool for a s or simple weapon. And one of the things that caught my eye on this chart was the elf, because the elf gets four simple weapons that they're proficient in, the short sword, the long sword, the short bow, and the long bow. If you really wanted to just pile on all of the tools for your character, using this optional rule, you can now have thieves tools, alchemist tools, cartographers tools, tools tools. I mean, you, you name it. You could use this optional rule to just have all the tools in the world there. 
uh, which which I thought was was interesting. At first, when I first read it, I thought, okay, they swap all four of those for just one tool. But all the internet research that I did said, no, no, Wally you're wrong. They get four tools if they want to swap that out. I said tool a lot. <laughs> <laughs> I can't, I'm trying to imagine that world. I, I'm, I'm trying to imagine uh, what it will all look like. Um, <laughs> it's it's it's, a, it's an interesting world. I don't I don't know that we're all going to be ready for it, frankly. Yeah. Well, since everyone's going to be playing dwarves, and dwarves actually get to choose between like uh, I think it's Smith tools or stone cutters or whatever else. So they're actually going to get five of them. So now that we're all playing dwarves, I mean. You know, you see where this is going. <laughs> um, so I feel like we kind of covered this subject good enough, but there is one more thing that I wanted to kind of throw at you, Fred, and I, kind of because I know you're unprepared for this. And that is, I'm going to ask you the question, if there is another edition, a sixth edition or what have you, how would you see ability scores going forward? Is this something that you think they'll always be, if Wizards were to be like, okay, we're going to do a sixth edition or a future edition, do you think they'll still be tied into racial abilities? Or do you think they could be moved to somewhere like backgrounds or classes? Or maybe just none at all? Actually, I think if, uh, since we've, we're dealing with um, Dungeons and Dragons 5.5 right now, um, and uh, the the next version of the game after 5.5 would be six. I think it's probably likely that they will backpedal a lot uh, with mm -hmm. a lot of this sort of content. I think they will start to say, "Oh, we went too far. Um, we gave them too much, and now the races don't really have anything distinct about them other mm -hmm. than what they look like." So I think that's probably very likely to occur. Uh, if they remove those aspects from the races, since they've almost always been there, I think we're starting to look at a game which isn't necessarily Dungeons and Dragons for a lot of people. Mm -hmm. um, so you would fracture the community. Uh, I think newer players would not care because they don't really look at older versions of the game. I think people who have played for a, a while and aren't happy have looked back at older versions and are playing OSR. Um, those of you know, those people who have been playing for a long time from the very get go, mm. probably not be very impressed and will homebrew everything back to where they need it to be. So I don't think that's a smart move by Wizards the Coast. I think that's not going to work. Yeah. And of course, that was just a hypothetical question, because there's just going to be 5.5, and then 5.75, and then 5.8, and stuff like that. So. <laughs> Okay, so with all of that being said, what's our final thoughts on this, Fred? Uh, how do you feel about the customizing your origin as a player and as a dungeon master? Okay, so as a player, I, I like it a lot. Uh, particularly if I was into min-maxing and power gaming, uh, it gives you a lot of variation and flexibility. Mm -hmm. So I don't see anything. If all I did is ever is just play the game, um, I wouldn't really be terribly upset by this. As a dungeon master, because I don't just play the game, I also dungeon master, I can actually see the holes and the problems that will be created. And saying something is optional in Dungeons and Dragons 5e is completely a waste of time yeah. because there are plenty of ways to go to a different group if you're not happy with the decisions the dungeon master is making so as soon as you say no mm -hmm. i don't like this players are just going to say well guess what see you later i'll go somewhere else uh and i think that's much more likely to happen so i don't like that flexibility but not so much everything it's around the ability scores i think there's too much flexibility around the ability score changes yeah that makes a lot of sense. For me, I, I'm on the same page. As a, as a player, I absolutely love it. I've recently recorded a Genie Warlock video, and I used this optional ability score thing to create an Air Genasi, which went more in theme with the Genie Warlock. And I thought it was really cool how I could just, you know, move things around. And it also 
makes it a dream come true to create a Sagittarius creature because once the centaur was released, I wanted to create an archer, you know, a, a Sagittarius-like creature, but the centaur didn't get any dex bonuses. It was strength and I think constitution or something like that. So thank you, Tasha's. Now I can make Sagittarius the, the archer and put him in a game. Uh, as a dungeon master, I'm, I still like it even as a dungeon master because I, I just like the idea of the players being able to maybe step out of their comfort zone. Maybe a player always played a tiefling because they played a, a, a spellcaster. And now for the first time they get to role play a half orc or role play a, a dragonborn or, or something along that line. And I, I, I haven't had a lot of interaction with min maxers and stuff like that. But from what I've heard, a lot of people that like to min-max their characters are going to min-max re regardless. So um, I, I guess even optional rules wouldn't, wouldn't stop them from doing so. So uh, it's, it's going to be interesting, and I'm going to reserve the right to change my mind in the future. But for right now, even as a dungeon master, I do, <laughs> I do like these abilities, and I'm looking forward to seeing what uh, players come up with. Uh, look, it's not that I dislike the rules completely with regard to this as being mm -hmm. optional. Mm -hmm. I just feel like they've just opened it up and said, just do whatever you like. And yeah. I think that was just that a bit too much. Floodgates completely open was probably doing too much, but it's a response. I think people need to understand that Wizards of the Coast is responding to Pathfinder second ed edition, mm. uh, where you have ultimate flexibility. And uh, you know, uh, time's gonna tell. I can't. I can't wait to see what happens, and and uh, you know, good or bad, or what comes of it, and what happens to our game that we love. So, I guess we'll find out. <laughs> okay, so that is customizing your origin and providing some feedback and thoughts about that. Again, this is an optional rule that you can find in Tasha's Cauldron of Everything, and I highly suggest that you go and take a look at it if you haven't done so already. Discuss it with your players and decide as a group if it's something that you're going to include in your game. And once again, I want to thank Fred for coming on the channel, and uh, thanks, thanks for joining us today, Fred. I always appreciate it when you come on. Thank you, Wally. I enjoyed it, and I look forward to doing it in the future. Absolutely. And if you are not a subscriber to Fred's channel, I highly suggest you go over and do that now. I will provide a link in the description below. He talks about Dungeons and Dragons and everything to do with it, all kinds of different videos, anything that you want to ask about it, he already has an answer. And Fred does a lot of live streams too. So if you're looking for that interaction, uh, go over and join him and, and harass him a little bit in the live chats. And uh, But yeah, Fred does a lot of live chat so go over and hang out he answers as many questions as he can and it's always a, a good time and a great community in his live chats so that is all i have for you today i hope you enjoyed the video we'll catch you in the next one and on to the next Um, there's actually one thing I kind of wanted to surprise you with, if that's okay. <laughs> oh, you go for it. All right. Hello there, adventurers, and welcome to Wally DM. Today I'm joined by Fred from the How to D&D channel, and we're going to tackle the very first subject that comes up in Tasha's Cauldron of Everything, and that is customizing your origins. This is a topic I'm sure you're excited about. Isn't that right, Fred? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Yes, I'm very excited about this one. Let's go! Let's do yes. it! <laughs> I'll, I'll do it again. I'll do it. I'll, I'll, okay. okay. <laughs> that was fun, though. I liked it. <laughs> I kind of just threw you on the spot. I'm sorry. You, you, <laughs> no, would, never, no, no. you would never throw me on the spot. <laughs> <laughs> no, I do it all the time. <laughs> all right. Uh, yeah, I'll take it from the top.